All right. Well, again, good morning. <clears throat> we are going to talk this morning about how to stand. How to stand. This is something that we run into all the time. Uh, this is one of the part of the one of the biggest questions either we get directed to us or that we see in the process of ministering to people uh, based on the things they say, based on how they speak, we recognize that they do not know how to stand. And, um, <clears throat> well, I'll give you some scriptures here in just a minute. Uh, I'd already talked about one of these before, was that a man came up to Smith Wigglesworth in a healing line, and the man had been ministered to by Wigglesworth the night before. When Wigglesworth or Smith recognized the man, he asked him, weren't you here last night? <clears throat> to which the man replied, yes. Wigglesworth turned him around, physically took the man. He's standing there looking at him, turned him around, and then kicked him in the rear end. And the man kind of stumbled forward, and he said, go sit down. You're healed now and too dumb to know it. Now, I haven't got that harsh yet, okay? Uh, but the fact is, many times people don't know how to stand once they've been ministered to. There's a lot of things that happen that people don't know happen. <clears throat> there are people that get healed, especially of internal things, don't even know they're healed. It happens during a healing service, happens during a, just a regular service <clears throat> where God just heals people uh, because they hear the word and they decide to believe and the minute they do, they get healed and they don't even know they're healed. They can't even tell a difference sometimes for, well, your body goes through cycles. There's a 24-hour cycle. <clears throat> there is various cycles. There's a three-day cycle, a four-day cycle, a seven-day cycle, a 21, a 14-day cycle, a 21-day cycle, uh, a 40-day cycle. These are all different cycles of different systems in the bodies. <clears throat> Sometimes if something goes on inside, you won't know it happened until one full cycle has gone on. And then you'll notice, oh, well, that doesn't bother me anymore. But you don't feel it when it happens. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. Sometimes, whenever you come into a healing line, that same thing happens. Hands will be laid upon you. The person that's ministering releases faith. Uh, you get healed, and you don't even know it. You can't even tell it, and that's when you have to decide, based on what the Word of God says, believers will lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover, that you have to decide to stand until you see that you don't have to stand anymore. And so sometimes people say, well, how long do I have to do this? Until you don't have to do it. It's real simple. It's not, there's not a set time you know, the, uh, a time limit, per se. But the key is, what it comes down to is this. What do you believe? <clears throat> when did you receive? Did you really receive? See, we, it's amazing how the church, uh, as a whole, has, they will find something of truth in the Bible, and then they will change it to where it doesn't mean anything anymore. In other words, <clears throat> Mark chapter 11 tells us in verse 23, 24, 23 mainly, <clears throat> that, well, and yeah, uh, that when we pray, we are to believe that we receive and we shall have. And that, it can't get any simpler or plainer than that. <clears throat> when you pray, believe you receive and you shall have. So when do you, when do you receive? When you pray not when you see it. Do you get it? So it doesn't say pray and believe when you see it that you have it. It doesn't say that. It says when you pray, believe that you receive when you pray. So when you receive is when you pray and you receive it and then you shall have it. Now, <clears throat> from the time that you believe you receive until you shall have it, you have to stand. See, people don't know that, or they don't, they don't realize it, that there is a standing that takes place, okay? <clears throat> One of the best examples we know of, or from the Bible anyway, uh, is, <clears throat> excuse me, the, whenever the woman had the boy, remember the, the woman told her husband, let's build the prophet a chamber. He comes by here all the time. Let's build him a little room there he can stay in. And then finally, he said, you know, what can I do for these people? And his servant told him, said, well, they don't have a child. He said, okay, 
uh, in the season this time next year, you'll have a child. And the woman said, you know, don't, don't play with me. Don't, you know, uh, you know I, we haven't asked you for anything. But as he said, they had a child. Then the child's growing and the child dies. And the dad sees the child is something wrong with him. He takes the child to the mother. At this point, the child hadn't died yet. Then the man goes back out to the field, and the child is there, and the child dies. The woman says, get the wagon, get the chariot, get everything ready, get the horses. We're going to go see the prophet. And so then, now notice, she left the child's body at the house, and she rode to the prophet. She gets there, and whatever, she starts to leave. The husband says, where are you going? I'm going to go see the prophet. Well, why? It's not time. All is well. Everything's good. She didn't even tell him he died. God bless that woman. I'm telling you, that's a woman of faith, okay? She didn't say nothing but what she was believing. All is well. All is well. <clears throat> then they see her coming, and the prophet says, go, go see what's going on with her. And <clears throat> she says, all is well, but then she says, come you know, to, my, to my house. And the, the, at first, the prophet says, no, we'll do it this way. She said, no, 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 you're coming. You're coming with me. And so they went back, and as you know the rest of the story, that whole time she kept saying, all is well, all is well, all is well. She never let any corrupt communication come out of her mouth. Because corrupt communication is anything that does not agree with the word of God. It's just that simple. Now, <clears throat> and the prophet went, and the boy came back alive. Now, this is what, now that's an Old Testament story. But that woman knew faith. And today we have a different idea. So now we try to change that a lot of times to where people, they'll quote the Bible, but then they got to let you know that, well, it didn't really like that yet. You know, yep, I believe I'm healed. Just waiting for the manifestation. Now, you, you just undid what you said. You, what you did was you really told us what you really believe, that you ain't got it yet. So don't try to twist it around and be cute with faith language, right? The Bible is clear. When you pray, believe you receive. Now, notice this. Even if you're not praying, let me put it this way, because this, this is what I actually wrote down. Decide what you believe. Say what you believe, not what you feel. Pray. Believe you receive. Do not let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. How you minister is also how you stand. In other words, now when I say how you minister, what I'm saying is this. <clears throat> when I minister to somebody, I lay hands on them before I touch them. Now, you see me go through a healing line and I go through and I, and I can go through pretty quick. Why? Because I decided before I started, when I touch them, it's done. Not the prayer. Not words, nothing else. The Bible says, believers lay hands. They shall recover. End of story. That's all I'm believing. Okay? I decide that before I touch anybody. So the minute I touch them, it's done. As far as I'm concerned, it's done. So if they come back, if they follow me down the line and go, well, yeah, but now the pain is still there. Okay? Then I'm, I'm in me. Now, I'm not dealing with what I believe now. I'm dealing with what they believe, right? Now, do I need to pray again? Can I pray again? Yeah, Jesus prayed twice, he, or he laid hands on a man twice, right? So there's nothing wrong with it. <clears throat> but if you want to receive your healing quicker, decide and settle it. See, I, I'm deciding and saying when I touch them, they're going to be healed. You have to decide when he touches me, I'm going to be healed. That is, see, you coming up and you saying that, that is your prayer. Now, maybe you're not praying, but you're saying, and you are deciding when you shall receive, right? So you have to decide that. Now, I can lay hands on you. I can deliver everything to you. Uh, it can be there. <clears throat> but if all you do is rehearse the problem, then no matter how much I put into you, you won't notice a difference because now it's equal. So nothing, it's neutral. You've neutralized the word that's gone into you. And so you have to make that decision of when he lays hands on me, I'm going to be healed. And I have to make that, just like he said in, in uh, Mark chapter 11, when you pray, believe that you receive. Now, here's the thing. 
And, and this is old school faith, right? This is just, this is how I learned faith in 1978, right? This is what I was doing back then. This is, and I was seeing that of when you pray, believe, you receive. And I kept hearing all these Christians say that they believe and they're waiting to receive. Now, they didn't always use those words. They said, well, I believe, I believe I'm healed, but waiting for the manifestation, which is another way of saying, I believe. See, that's my religious talk, but the reality is I hadn't seen it yet. And so they're neutralizing, and those same people went that way for years. I mean, whatever it was, and, it, and they did the same thing, whether it was sickness or a, a need of some other sort, some physical something, a uh, blessing of somehow, and they never received. Why? Because they never believed they received. They, they believe the Bible. Well, he says, if I pray, I'll get it. They believe that. But they don't believe when they pray that they have received. Because once you believe that you have received when you pray, from that point on, you cannot say you don't have it. Because the minute you say you don't have it or act as though you don't have it or somehow let people know you don't have it, then you are nullifying and showing what faith you had might have went a little, a little while, but then it stopped. Real faith doesn't stop until it gets what it came for. Okay? A lot of people have little faith. And even a little faith can get the answer. Why? Because it's faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. But now when you talk about little faith, see, the Bible doesn't talk about little faith in size because the size of a grain of mustard seed will get the job done. When it says little faith, it's not talking about the size of the faith. It's talking about the endurance of the faith. In other words, how long did that faith continue? Little faith continued a little while, right? Mark chapter 4, clear all this up for you. Go read it. It's a parable. Of the, they call it the parable of the sower. It's really the parable of the soil. You get to decide what kind of soil you're going to be. Now, this is the essence of how to stand because once you believe that you have received, now you stand, and, and here's how to figure out if you're standing. Do you think about it? If your mind is on it all the time, you ain't standing. Okay? You have not believed that you have received. You're still waiting to receive. Most people pray too quick. You have to... The, it's, it's the best way to receive, actually, is to spend some time in preparation. Have you ever notice what farmers do? <clears throat> a lot of their time is not spent in sowing. A lot of their time is spent in preparing the soil. They go through, they have to break it up, they have to do all this stuff, and even when there's no seed in the ground, they have to take care of the soil. And so a lot of people don't do that. They just find a promise, oh, yep, that's what I need. I, I believe I received, thank you, Jesus. And, they're going, and they haven't believed they received. They've said words. With their lips, they draw, they draw nigh to God, but their heart is still far from him because you have to believe with the heart. And so you have to decide beforehand. It's better to go in and convince yourself the reality of the word of God and of the promise that it is yours, it is for you, and that you are going to receive it. And then when you have your scriptures and you've prepared your heart, the soil, then you make an event of it. If, 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 this is, if you're learning how to do this, in the beginning, it will be an event. And when you make that event, you go, okay, now I'm going to pray. And you go step by step. And you decide, once I pray and believe that I have received, I am not going to bring that up again. Why? Because I have received it. It's done, over with, done, got it, done. That's it. And so until you can do that, you have not believed, right? If you believe you're going to be healed, you are not believing the Bible, okay? So what we have to realize is this. You, there is a point where you have to stand. I'll give you some examples. Uh, just kind of give you the one with Wigglesworth just now. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> years ago, we were in Boulder, Colorado. I was at a church there doing a DHT <clears throat> one point, and then later on we went back there, as a matter of fact, and held our annual conference there. And <clears throat> when I was doing the DHT, during every break in the DHT, because, uh, you know, life goes on, 
while the DHD is going on. It's funny because when I'm in a DHD and teaching, right, everything else doesn't stop. My phone keeps ringing. People keep calling in for prayer. People trying to die. I mean, they need help, all this kind of stuff. It keeps on going on. So every time I get a break, <clears throat> see, that's, I don't need a break. I can go, as most of you know, I could preach two, three, four. I mean, you know, there, no one knows how long I could preach yet. <laughs> Because I've never, I've never came to a place where I was done. I've just stopped, okay? Uh, because I, I have preached over 12 hours without my Bible. I did that in Omaha, Nebraska one time when, at a house. Went there and was waiting for a, a flight and uh, spend the night there uh, with some people there and preached for 12 hours. And so I know I can do that, right? Now, I haven't gone beyond that personally, uh, but I'm willing to try. I just can't find a lot of people that want to <laughs> join in with me on it. <clears throat> but I don't need breaks. Uh, if I take a break, it's for you, right? Now, the only reason I take breaks is so that I can go back and check my phone, check the texts that come in, the calls that come in, all these things. Why? Because while I'm out here, people are trying to die. And so I try to keep up with what's going on, and during the breaks, I'll make callbacks or whatever I need to do. So anyway, <clears throat> I'm just saying that because... When I was in Boulder, Colorado, there was a, during, I started getting calls. And there was a man in Arizona that called. And the first time he called, he left a message, and he was panicking. I mean, he was a young man uh, in his early to mid-20s, I guess, <coughs> if I remember <coughs> correctly. And he called and left a message, panicking. So I called him back because I didn't know what the problem was, but I know it had something to do with his mother. <clears throat> so I called him back, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm on a break. What's, what's going on? You know? And he told me, he said, oh, Brother Curry, uh, my mom's dying. She's, she's dying. The doctor says she's going to die. This, you know, there's no hope, all this kind of stuff. She has less than 24 hours to live. I'm like, oh, yeah. And he was panicking. <clears throat> and I, he, he, just, he was taking her, or had just taken her to the hospital. This was going on. And so I told him, I said, okay. So first I had to calm him down. And I got him calm. I said, okay, now I'm going to pray. Your mom's going to be fine. She's going to be okay. She will live and not die. And here's what will happen. And I told him what was going to happen. <clears throat> so he said, okay. So I got him calmed down, and then I prayed. And I, when I say pray, I mean I was commanding. I was speaking life, doing, you know, just how we minister. And I said, all right, <clears throat> now call me 24 hours. Call me again. So now she had already been told she had less than 24 hours. By the time I talked to him, she probably, according to the doctor, had about 22 hours, 20, 21, 22 hours, according to the doctor. So when I told him to call me in 24 hours, that would have been at least two or three hours after her 24 hours was up. That makes sense? So then, <clears throat> next day, I'm back, I'm teaching everything, and take a break. Guess what? He calls. When he calls... <laughs> <clears throat> He's panicking. I answer the phone. He's almost screaming. I mean, he's just panicking. My mom, there's no, there's no change. My mom's, she's still dying. She, there's been no change. I don't see. And I said, whoa, 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 stop. I said, wait. You said there's no change. Yeah, yeah, there's no, been no change. Uh, you told me 24, 26 hours ago now uh, that she had less than 24 hours. He said, yeah. And I said, but she's still alive. Yeah. I said, that's a change. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, I guess it is. So I got him calmed down. I re reinforced the command that we gave. I said, here's what's going on. I said, call me again tomorrow morning. Next morning, he calls me, panicking like usual. I mean, just going off. Oh, this ain't, why isn't this working? I don't see anything. And I, but now this is the third day. So I'm getting fed up, right? <coughs> and so I, he, he called me again. I answered the phone, and I said, all right. And he was, you know, Screaming, crying, the whole bit. And I just told him, I said, listen, listen. And I had to start getting forceful with him. Well, but you don't understand. It's, it's been the three days now. And it's been, I said, I finally, I just told him, I said, shut up. And he got quiet because most preachers don't talk to people like that. And so he got quiet. I said, now listen to me. I said, three days ago, you told me your mother had less than 24 hours. I said, so now every minute over that 24 hours that she has lived is a victory for Jesus. 
and it's another minute that the devil is defeated. I said, now, when your mother is completely healed back home and doing fine, know this, it wasn't your faith that did it. It was mine. And he got, and see, that's, you know, not how I normally talk to people, right? <clears throat> but he got real quiet. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, I understand. I said, now you need to quit panicking. I said, luckily, this has nothing to do with you. I said, because if it did, your mom would be dead now. I mean, I, I got just <laughs> real frank with him, right? I don't know who Frank was, but whoever it was, he got a real <laughs> there. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but, um, so we went back and forth. <clears throat> then I preached that Sunday. After church on Sunday, and this is Sunday evening. Now we're four days in, the whole bit, in, you know, over four days. And he calls me. And he says, Brother Curry, I just want to let you know, uh, they released my mom, taking her home. She's fine. They can't find anything wrong with her now. But, but the funny thing was, I told him, I said, strange, you don't seem as emotional about that as you did about her dying. He said, yeah, I'm just realizing I don't, I, don't, I don't know faith. I don't know what faith is. And I said, well, now you do. I said, because you've been hearing it the last four days. I said, that's how faith talks. And he said, well, but how did you know that? Because it was exactly what I told him. I said, the thing will come to a point, and it'll reverse, and then it'll go back. You know, it goes up, and it'll reverse and go back. I said, that's how it'll happen. How did you know that? I said, uh, two ways. Number one, the Bible says it. The Bible says that what I say will come to pass if I believe in my heart. I believe what the Bible says about your mom being healed. And I believe it, and I said it. <clears throat> I said, now, secondly, uh, because of the promise, I stand on that. He said, but how did you know? And I said, I knew because I choose to know. I said, that's how I know this. I said, I choose to believe what the Bible says. He said, and that's all there is to it. I said, well, you say that's all there is to it but you wasn't ready to do it for four days. And I said, so you have to reach a point where that word is more real than the sickness your mother faced. And so, and that was that. Now, the reason I'm telling you this, okay, now let me give you another one. Uh, <clears throat> most of you know, how many of you have heard of Angelo? Okay, that's... A lot. It's about 50-50, I guess. I might have to tell the story. Not today. I don't have time for it. If I do have time, I'll bring it at the end so you'll know what I'm talking about, all right? <clears throat> but I had plenty of opportunity uh, after I ministered to a young man named Angelo Braindead. Uh, and so, I mean, he was on life support and everything. And I ministered to him, and I had ample opportunity. As soon as I left the hospital, everybody gathered around. Oh, you know this. I had to tell him, this is the way it'll be. How do I know well, he, Angelo will live and not die. How do you know? Did God speak? Yep. He said, I lay hands on I guess I'm telling the story now. Anyway. <laughs> so, but there was a crowd there that kept trying to get me to say that God didn't speak to me. Why? Because all I said was Mark 16. Did God speak to you? Yes, Mark 16. He said, believe lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. So God didn't speak to you? Yes, God spoke to me. What did he say? They, we went through this. I mean, back and forth. And they said, what did he say? I said, he said, Mark 16. And they, they were thinking he had to speak to me while I was there. But God had already spoke to me. Why? Now, I'm not saying I heard a voice. I'm saying God wrote me a letter by Mark and said, right, that I will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Mark 16, 18 through 20, that's to me. Just as it's to you. I believe it's to me. That is God speaking to me right then. And every time I open it up and look at it, he's speaking to me right then too. So he's always speaking that to me. So he did not need to speak that to me when I went into Angelo. He had already spoken it to me. <clears throat> so I went by that. They didn't understand that. They thought God had to give a word right then and say, this is the way it'll be. And that's not uh, trusting God, te technically. I mean, it, a word can come. But if you operate by faith, you don't need a word. You, you've got a word, right? And so you don't need a special word right then. So we went back and forth. Then later, the, they heard or Angelo passed away. 
<clears throat> and the man came to our room where we were staying and wanted to basically to tell me that he had passed away and wanted me to, really wanted me to explain why. Why didn't it work? And I didn't say anything. He tells me Angelo is dead, and I'm like, hmm, that's surprising me, okay? And I stand there, we just, I just look at him. He looks at me, I look at him, we stand there for a while, he's waiting for me to say something, waiting for me to make an excuse. I didn't, why? Because I had already put my faith out, I wouldn't bring it back in. When you put your faith out is when you speak the word of God and say this is the way it'll be. Whenever you, if, to take your faith back, you have to say something contrary to what you said the first time. So I didn't take my faith back. I didn't say, oh, well, you know, sometimes we do lose some. Sometimes. No, see right then, I would have released it, and Angelo would have stayed dead, and they would have buried him. Instead, I did not change it. Why? It was my faith on the line. It wasn't anybody else's. I was the one that laid hands. I'm the believer. I have to keep believing, and I can't stop believing at any point. My faith is as great as it will continue going. At the point you stop it, then your faith is little because you, it has not attained what it, what it was sent to do. Okay, hopefully you're getting all this at the same time. Now, so I didn't make an excuse. We stood. I went walk around praying in tongues, uh, just talking to God about it. And then the next morning we found out Angelo was alive. He came back alive. His brain was functioning correctly. Everything was good. And everybody was surprised, all right? And as soon as the testimony of Angelo started going through the crowd, people started getting out of wheelchairs before anybody even prayed for him. And so we saw the good, what God did through that testimony. Now, the reason I'm telling this is because in these two situations, I had to stand. It, now, understand, the way you stand, um, it, when I minister, like I said before, I release my faith, it's done, that's that. That's how you stand. How you minister to someone is how you stand. If you need to be ministered to, if let's say you need uh, healing, then when we minister to you, then at that point, you have to decide. Now, if you don't decide, my faith is still there. It will still keep working. You can work against it. You can't stop it, but you can smother it. In other words, your unbelief in that sense, because you will keep speaking that, well, I don't feel anything. I don't see anything. I don't know anything's changed. I don't feel anything all this kind of stuff, then you'll keep saying that until eventually you keep piling dirt on top to where it can't grow through, right? That's the best way I can explain it. But to stand. <clears throat> when we were, when we first started, uh, actually, I guess 1980 was when we first kind of launched out. And we were right over here in Wiley. And it was bad. I got laid off Well, the plant shut down, so I didn't have a job. Wasn't any jobs around. I had no transportation. Uh, I mean, it was, it was dire circumstances. It was the worst we had ever been in. And we had nothing. And our money was going out real quick. Uh, had babies, uh, two, two children in diapers, uh, everything. And rent was due, phone bill was due. I mean, it,